Age of Wonders 4 is the best game I've played in years. Everything about this game is good. The gameplay is absolutely fantastic, the graphics are beautiful, and the music is awesome. To top it all off, it's a highly polished product. In 100 hours of gameplay, I only noticed one bug, and it was only because I was being stupid and refusing to concede defeat in a lost battle. It's just such a smooth and functional game. Anyway, this is not a sponsored video or anything. I just love this game and this series. So let's talk a little bit about the game and then go over its necromancy and magic. Age of Wonders 4 is the latest game in a series of 4x games that have you playing as a supremely powerful mage. We're talking like demigod type of stuff. The series is similar to a bunch of other 4x games with the more or less spiritual successes to a very old game called Master of Magic. These games all have similarities with each other, and I honestly like all of them, but Age of Wonders does it best, in my opinion. If you're curious, the other games I'm referring to are the Eador games, like Eador Genesis, Eador Masters of a Broken World, Eador Imperium. The Elemental games, like Elemental War of Magic and Elemental Fallen Enchantress, and the Warlock games, like Warlock Master of the Arcane, and Warlock 2. All of these games are good in their own right, and each one does the genre justice. But anyway, back to Age of Wonders. If you're on Linux like me, and you want to play this game, it runs just fine using Proton Experimental. All you need to do is modify the launch arguments a little to prevent the game launcher from launching, and instead target the game itself. Thanks to Seosm for reporting this and saving me some time. All the footage you're watching has also been recorded on Linux. And I must apologize for any background noise you might hear during this recording. Um, it's really hot here and I've had the AC running. I tried to filter out any noise, but a little bit got through. So there's an entire campaign mode and stuff which I haven't touched. I'm more into just rolling my own world and making my own story. And Age of Wonders 4 gives you incredible options for that. So when you do a custom game, you get to either choose one of their official worlds, which is like a pre-made thing that's kind of tailor-made, makes a lot of sense. Or what you can do is you can go and create a custom realm, and it remembers every custom world realm you've made, so if you like one a lot, you can revisit it and play it again. Let's just take a look at this. So the things you can do is... You can do lots of things. The first thing you can do is choose the geography. So you can have like an oceanic world, coastal world, a divide, which is like two big continents with a, a river down the middle, or an ocean down the middle. You can have islands, a completely land one, or crazy stuff like lava divide and lava lakes. There's like lots of things here and they seem to be adding to it. Because I don't remember Barren Oceans being here before, which is really cool. Then you get to choose the climate of this world. It can be like a desert realm, or like rolling fields. It can be like a forming realm, which is like really volcanic. Frozen realm, highlands, an overgrown realm, which is quite nice. It's basically complete forest or jungle or whatever. Or like, you know, a fiery, desolate world. Then what you can do after that is you can choose the inhabitants. So they can be like astral invaders, which are all creatures from the astral sea, which are kind of like Cthulhu type entities, outsiders, that kind of thing. A demonic realm. Dragon Territories is a new one that came with the recent update. One I like a lot is Lingering Craters, because it makes just giants and, and ogres everywhere, which is kind of interesting in my opinion. You can also have an Undeath Realm. I'll tell you what, I'm going to start choosing these things so I can progress here. Let's go for Overground. Anyway, moving along. A Presence Trait is an interesting one. It basically lets you... It does something unique with the world that makes it different each time. For example, the Archon Prophet. It makes a really strong order-aligned faction. Think like Paladins. And all the three cities in the world start as a vassal of that holy faction. So, as you can imagine, this faction gets a huge head start, and almost everyone either chooses to team up 
and align themselves with that Archon Prophet, or they have to fight against the Archon Prophet. There's various other ones you can do, like the Druidic Alliance, which basically starts two powerful Druids that have a head start together in an alliance. There's Pretender Kings, which is basically two really powerful um, kings that are at odds of each other, and you can either form an alliance of one of them, or defeat both of them, whatever. Just basically custom ways to win the game, aside of the usual victory conditions. We'll go with none for this playthrough. Then there's other miscellaneous traits you can do. For example, you can have a massive underground, or a really small underground. Or you can have like a wondrous past which adds lots of ancient wonders. Ancient wonders are things which your heroes can enter, and inside them you'll find various stuff like um, typically enemies to fight, plus a little story like a quest, and um, some kind of reward at the end. Banner Lords is a good one. So is City States, it makes all the free cities really large and makes them more powerful. You can also choose to have no free cities if you want. There's lots of things you can do. One I really like is regenerating infestations, because it causes lots and lots of hostile enemies to spawn, like hostile kind of bandit factions and whatnot. And this is really good for a number of reasons. Firstly, it gives you lots of resources from fighting these guys. Like if you're a necromancer, every battle will give you corpses to make more undead with, for example. But also defeating them helps level up your heroes. And it also gives you money and magic items. So I always like to get that one. You can also do mega cities if you want. This means that rather than have many little cities, every player has to have one very large city. That can be interesting sometimes. Other interesting ones are stuff like Curse of Undeath. Basically every um, free city and sort of random hostile unit gains the Curse of Undeath. This means that when it dies it's resurrected again with 20% of its hit points after one turn. So basically you kill enemies, they won't stay dead, they get up again. There's all kinds of various cool things you can do here. But anyway, moving along. Moving along, we get to choose our faction. And of course, they've got these existing ones you can choose from. I typically go for a custom one. I have a bunch of custom guys here. So let's do a custom race. So what I generally do is go for human because I'm a bit boring in that way I guess but I'm kind of a human supremacy guy in these fantasy games I like to crush these wretched fantasy races um, lizard folk look pretty cool though I gotta say there's two cool things you can do is unlike a lot of games where the races kind of have their traits baked in you actually get to customize yours so you can come in here and you can choose something unique for your race um, one I really like to have is, where is it now, Quick Reflexes. It makes your guys 30% harder to hit with ranged attacks. I find that to be so, so useful in this game. Then you can do another talent, which is a mind trait. I tend to go for Tenacious, because it, it means that as your units get killed off, they won't become so ineffective. Overwhelm Tactics is another good one. But, you know, generally speaking, everything here is pretty good. And it can cause them to have, like, different starting conditions as well. Like, if you have an underground adaptation, I believe you're more likely to spawn underground. Ferocious is another nice one. What is their origin culture? Then you get to choose their culture. And this is really awesome because not only does it determine the race's um, basic magic benefits they give you, but it also gives them different default units. So ones I like are Barbarian, and with them you get less cavalry options, but you get Berserkers and some really good archers. Uh, one of my favorite units is the Fury, which is this uh, woman back here with the spear. 
She's the kind of unit that... Sorry, she's not a Fury. Fury is the Archer. Whatever this one's called, I've forgotten her name. But in any case, she's um, the kind of unit that can fight up close and at range really well. So it doesn't matter if the enemies close in on her, she can still be very effective. But most Necromancers are going to want the Dark Faction, which gives you a head start in the Shadow Magic. Um, you can also be a Barbarian Necromancer, I've done that before, or a Mystic Necromancer even. But anyway, the Dark Culture, they get these Swordsmen, which are really good. They basically charge in and they'll break the defense of any Defender unit. So like, um, you send these guys in, they whack. It disrupts the defensive posture of the enemy, so then another unit can engage without suffering attacks of retaliation. So I find that really useful. They also have a Dark Knight unit, which is a bit like a Death Knight, and he's capable of using um, kind of area of effect magic on the enemy, which is pretty nice. What defines their society? Next up, you get to choose society traits. So. All of these are really awesome, of course. One of my favorites is Ruthless Raiders, because um, every time you... What do you get now? Oh no, wait, yes. Yes, this is what I'm thinking of. Every time you win, um, win a fight, you get Draft and Gold Income. Draft lets you recruit more units. So basically, every time you win a battle, you get a surge of manpower, and you can use that to create even more troops. So you kind of like, you get money and more, more unit production from winning battles. So I like that one a lot. Um, another one that's really good is somewhere down here, the shadow ones. Scions of Evil is a nice one. Basically, the more evil you get, the more draft you earn, and also the more Imperium you, you, you gain. And units also get extra ranks and stuff, so those two are a great combination for a path of ultimate destruction. Choose your first tome. Finally, Magic. you get to choose your initial tome. So for a necromancy run, what you probably want is the Tome of Souls. This will get you started off with um, the, the collection of souls which is a resource you use to buy undead units with. And it also gives you spells, access to research like the Bone Golem. You can also go for um, cry Cryomancy, which is also a shadow magic um, thing, so it kind of contributes to the same set of stuff, but it gives you different starter spells. You can also go for Chaos if you want, which I love a lot. Tome of the Horde is a great one. It basically empowers all your tier 1 units, so it gives you Fury of the Horde, which lets all tier 1 units become 1 strengthened. And um, it also gives you a mob camp structure you can make, which cheapens them all by 20%. So this is a great one if you want to amass like lots of cheap units. Skeletons are considered a tier 1 unit, so it helps out with necromancers as well. Generally speaking, I find Chaos very good. Fire is the, the other Chaos option there. Of course, for a Necromance, we're just going to go with Tome of Souls. What is your ruler's origin? Then finally, you get to choose what kind of um, ruler you have. And typically, for magic, what you want is a Wizard King. Dragon Lord's a new one. Don't know much about it yet. But Wizard King, you get more mana spells are cheaper and you can cast two spells once per battle like two spells in one turn Reveal yourself. and finally you get to design your character and you know various things about it like any old sort of game you know you can choose their equipment their body type you know whether they're male or female all that kind of thing you can make them fat and thin, you can even change their race if you want. So it's perfectly fine to have a cat ruling over humans. It's not tied to whatever your faction is. Um, you also get to choose their starter weaponry. 
These ones with the crest, they've been unlocked through previous playthroughs. Like, I won once with a Barbarian or something, it gave me the access to um, a Great Axe starter. But there's also Orbs of Necromancy I got. That's a great one for a magic um, hero, whatever. You can choose their helmets. There's lots of options here. Basically, yeah, you can just go through it, pick whatever you want. Very nice. You can make the, you can change the eye color, hair color, all this stuff. Just like, you know, you'd expect. Lots of options. And when you click um, select, it'll throw you into the world and you'll start playing. Let's talk quickly about the resources in the game. So the first resource is Imperium. And this is spent on a number of things. It's used for upkeep of very important late game units. It's used for founding cities. It's used in quests sometimes. And it's used for your affinity tree. More on that later. Then you've got food, which contributes to the growth of your population in cities. Then you have draft, which is basically a resource that accumulates and can be spent almost exclusively on troops. So unlike the other games where you had um, buildings and troops both using the same resources in terms of like what you can do at a time, you can now make troops and buildings simultaneously and separate from each other, which is a really nice improvement over the previous game because if I'm remembering correctly, and I might be confusing it with Warlock here, but you had to make a choice, either units or buildings. And so there's all this kind of like, what do I do? Do I make troops or do I focus on buildings? Now you can do both, which is really nice. Next up, you have gold. This is used for all kinds of things, mostly buildings and recruiting troops. You have casting points. This is the amount, basically every spell in the game costs some casting points to cast, in addition to mana. And casting points are free, you get them on every new turn, and once they're all used up you can't cast any more spells until the next turn. Then of course you have mana, this is used for casting spells, as well as unit upkeep, especially magic unit upkeep. Souls is a resource used for necromancy abilities. It's often used independently of gold and mana to cast necromancy spells and recruit minions. For example, if you want to recruit skeleton warriors, it will cost you 10 souls and then nothing else, just souls and draft. And the upkeep for the skeletons is actually mana. But it's really handy with this souls thing because you can be struggling on the gold and mana fronts but still have enough souls to be able to keep recruiting undead units. Finally, you have research, which is what is used to um, purchase new spells and also research new books. So how, um, how research works is, as it accumulates, you can spend it on spells, and every four spells that you learn, you can choose a new Tome of Magic that increases the relevant affinity and provides new abilities for heroes, new structures to build, and gives you new spells to learn. The ultimate necromancy book is called the Book of the Eternal Lord, and of all the spells it teaches you, my personal favorite is Summon Undead Army. You can use this to create a full stack of random undead units on the target world map square. The spells you can learn come in three different types, and I don't know the correct category names, so bear with me here, but essentially what you've got are battlefield spells. These are spells that are used during battles, like for example fireballs or cursing enemies, and summoning creatures that only last the duration of a single battle. Then you've got map spells, which are used on the campaign map to do something like summon a permanent unit or debuff an enemy army, terraform the world, etc. All these kinds of spells to some kind of use on the campaign map. Then you've got unit enchantments. These upgrade units with some kind of beneficial effect. A simple example is something like the flaming weapons enchantment, which causes units weapons to deal fire damage. 
but the effects of these enchantments can be a lot more interesting, like cursing enemies, sapping their morale, and so on. The catch is that it increases the overall upkeep of all of your units, but it does make them significantly better. And one of the primary benefits of unit enchantments is it takes those cheap level 1 units and keeps them relevant until the late game. Finally, the last kind of spell you've got are called Race Transformations. And Race Transformations are the most interesting category of spell because they allow you to transform your faction's race in incredible ways. There are two categories of Race Transformations, Minor and Major. You can have as many minor ones as you like, but major ones override the other major ones, so you have to pick. A good example of a minor race transformation is Reveler's Heart, which gives the target race goat legs, like a satyr, an increased morale, or the Frostling transformation which makes them happier in snow biomes and gives frost resistance and increases movement speed in cold terrain. Major race transformations include Whiteborn for Necromancers, which causes the entire race to gain life-stealing attacks and become undead. This generally turns them into tough customers, especially with life-stealing, because undead seem unusually tough and resilient to begin with, but add in life-stealing to the mix and they just keep healing themselves in combat. The downside is, of course, that they become vulnerable to holy attacks. Chaos, on the other hand, gets Demonkin, which will transform the race into demons and gives them flight and frenzied attacks. When it comes to the choice between Whiteborn or Demonkin, I think both are great options for Necromancers. Whiteborn encourages a slow and steady wins the race kind of philosophy because of the undead resilience and the life stealing, which kind of makes your units just refuse to die. Whereas Demonkin will give your undead the ability to fly, which makes them incredibly mobile, and it generally causes them to be great at attacking due to the frenzy. The only downside is that it requires the momentum of battle be to be kind of in your favor. The undead, they don't really care about casualties, but the demons will get spooked like if enough of your guys die at once, so that's something to keep in mind. The coolest thing about the race transformations is combining them together to create your perfect race of minions. If you want a race of flying undead demons with bark skin and frostling blood in their veins, I'm pretty sure that's a possible combination. Next we come to the affinity tree. Each turn your affinities produce points which unlock nodes in the affinity tree. You can spend your Imperium here to purchase awesome things that have really strong benefits. There are also one-off rituals that you can use to, for example, summon an army of um, outsiders or a bandit army. There's also some repeatable rituals such as the, the one that lets you raise the city cap. But most of the rites are single use, unfortunately. In my opinion, it would be so nice just to be able to keep spending Imperium to summon more and more outsiders. It wouldn't be much of a necromancy video if I didn't tell you some of the types of undead available. So the first thing to mention is that if you go for the undead race transformation, the white trans the whiteborn race transformation, all your units become a kind of undead. But that aside, the dedicated undead units are the skeletons which are your tier 1 undead unit. They cost 10 souls to make, which is really cheap, and they're also spearmen. This is exceptionally useful because they're fantastic at killing anything considered to be large, like giants, and also anything considered to be cavalry. They also benefit from all of your race transformations, so despite being a tier 1 unit, they can pack an almighty punch at the end of the game because they'll have layers of unit enchantments and layers of race transformations on them. Bone Golems are the tier 2 undead unit. They are undead siege weapons and great at demolishing obstacles and sieges. But they're also just great as shock troops because they can break defensive lines with their charge attack. The charge attack causes an attacked enemy to drop their guard, which lets your other units attack that enemy without fear of retaliation. Each Bone Golem can also heal by consuming corpses, and will also spawn a Skeleton Unit on death. 
So in a lot of ways they count as two units in one. Banshees are tier three undead units, but they come from the frost side of the shadow magic, I think. They are spellcasters that shoot ice bolts at enemies, but can also blink around the place and wail to debuff enemies. The corrupt souls are kind of like shadow people of your race. They're a tier three unit, and they sap the morale of enemy units of each of their strikes. They can also outright kill a demoralized enemy, and if it fails to kill them, they still deal significant frost damage of that attack. So honestly, these are really useful units, because in a lot of cases you can use them just to outright kill an enemy unit. Living Shadows are gigantic shadowy demons that have a chance of inflicting insanity when they hit enemies. Insanity will cause enemies to do a random, often detrimental action, rather than whatever makes sense during combat. For example, they might run through a flaming field of fire and attack someone on their own side. Aside of inflicting this useful status effect, they are also just a big, strong, tier 4 shadow demon. And overall, they're a great unit. The Reaper unit is the strongest undead unit, and it attacks with a scythe, and it can also kill enemies with a Finger of Death-like ability. I haven't used them much because they're hideously expensive, and despite being a pretty cool unit, I find the Living Shadows to be a better investment. I think something needs to be done to improve this unit because they're just too expensive to be worth it. You're much better off with a combination of Corrupt Souls and Living Shadows, I find. Next we come to Heroes. So your faction leader counts as your main hero, and as they level up they get signature skills. It's typically a unique once per battle skill that your hero can use. It can be of any spell category, and it costs zero mana to cast. My favorite ones are the summoning ones, like summon animal, summon elemental, and summon undead. If you're lucky with these abilities, and you can get a lot of free units in each battle this way. In the previous update, this used to be rather broken. Not in an incredibly broken sense, but just in the sense that you would get all these units for free each battle and they would last the entire battle. What they did in a recent patch was actually put a timer on them, so they become far more expendable. One of the nicest things about Age of Wonders 4, in my opinion, is the ascension mechanic. What this does is encourage you to see a game through, regardless of whether it's a win or a loss because completing games will earn you ascension points. Obviously you get more points if you win, but you still get some if you lose. These points can be spent on things in a tree that give you access to new pieces of equipment, new faction logos, new starting equipment, and in my opinion, most excitingly and importantly, new options during map and character development. For example, one of the abilities you unlock as a shadow guy so either as a shadow guy or either a chaos guy, you unlock a kind of racial improvement or racial feature that will prevent you from being able to, to acquire new cities. But for every city you raise, you get a permanent income from that city. A permanent source of mana, gold, and research, I think. So basically your job as this faction is to run around just raising cities which is a nice way to play in my opinion. I'm scoring Age of Wonders 4 a solid 10 out of 10 for its minion mechanics. You just can't fault it. Like these kind of 4x games, they, they get um, an unfair advantage over other games when it comes to the minion mechanics scoring. But not only is it 10 out of 10 for the minion mechanics, but it's just 10 out of 10 for everything else as well. I absolutely love this game and it's the best game I've played in years. Thank you devs for warming this old lich's soul. The only thing I dislike about the game is the Whiteborn race transformation. I think it's a great option as like an option for an undead race transformation, but it's not my ideal option. I personally would prefer a race of skeletons or ghosts or any kind of undead really than ghouls. Ghouls are among my least favorite undead. I'm sorry ghoul fans, but I just don't like the way they look much. They're more gross than cool, in my opinion. So I would like a few different kinds of undead race transformation options. I think a skeleton one would be really good, and so would a ghost one. Maybe even a shadow person one. So basically my criticism is there's not enough flavor of undead race transformations. 
For this reason, I tend to go for the demonic race transformation instead, and just end up with a race of flying winged skeletons, which is honestly pretty awesome. Another thing I absolutely love about this game, that I haven't mentioned until now, is the siege mechanics. So when you besiege a city, you can set up siege projects, and these projects reduce the amount of time required to breach the walls and attack the city. You get all kinds of awesome potential siege projects, like for example, the Chaos, um, the Chaos Affinity will provide you with War Dogs. Basically, when the siege starts, you gain six War Dogs on your side, and you can send these War Dogs forth and they just attack. You know, it's like three, three units to help you win the siege. You can construct catapults, you can construct ballistas, there's various kinds of undead themed um, siege projects, like one of them will spawn zombies at the start of battle on your side. There's like an arcane storm you can use that will, that will just deal damage to all enemy units at the start of battle. Just things like that, there's lots of unique and nice flavors of things you can do to help win a siege. And I really like that. Thank you for watching. I hope this video has been informative. I've got more videos and necromancy stuff coming soon. And I hope to see you on the next video.